Alors, on est très heureux de présenter cette expo de Diane Boss, qui est une artiste dont on suit le travail depuis plusieurs années. D'abord parce qu'elle euh, a un travail formidable, très intéressant par rapport au champ de l'art contemporain, de la photographie, mais elle ne se définit pas elle-même comme photographe, d'ailleurs. C'est quelqu'un qui s'intéresse à la manière dont on voit le monde, dont on peut euh, parler de l'histoire, la mettre en scène aujourd'hui, et quel rapport avec la mémoire tout cela peut induire du point de vue de l'artiste. Euh, mais Diane a aussi une histoire particulière avec la France parce qu'elle elle vit une partie de, de son temps en France. Elle connaît très bien ce pays. Elle connaît aussi l'histoire euh, de, de l'optique, de la photographie en France. Et donc, il y a une profondeur dans son travail qui, est, euh, qui nous emmène dans plusieurs champs. Alors ici, bien sûr, plus particulièrement sur les champs de bataille de la Première Guerre mondiale, euh, les, champs, les sites du front de l'Ouest, donc en Belgique et en France, sur lequel elle va nous donner donc un, un aperçu euh, extrêmement euh, nouveau, très touchant, de euh, la manière dont on peut aujourd'hui ressentir ce qui a pu se passer là. Diane and I first started talking in 2014 when she had, she had been to France and to Belgium and had made some of the photographs. And I went and visited with her in her studio. And at first I thought, oh, this is a project that's about World War I, 100 years later. But then when I saw the images, I realized it was not what I was thinking at all, uh, that it's very much about us in the present and that It happened 100 years ago, this incredibly devastating war, and it still continues to be important for us today, even though, I mean, I wasn't alive, you know, my parents weren't alive, it's not a direct experience or just one generation. But it was such a horrific event, the, the way that warfare changed, the huge loss of life, I mean, the, the sheer numbers of people killed, but also in Canada, We still talk about World War I because it was so important that, uh, for Canada in terms of developing a nation. And that's what we're taught in school. We're taught about that part in school uh, in Canada. So the works themselves, they're about how we have come through all of this kind of memory. So people's individual memories. There's all these novels and these poems that have written. And the poems have become very famous as well. And it's become our cultural memory. So it's not an individual memory or a personal one. Uh, it was what the, the theor theorist Marita Sturkin talks about, this idea of cultural memory. So where you take the individual and then it builds up and it becomes your cult part of your cultural fabric. The other part of it for me is that um, the theorist Alva Noe, uh, he's a philosopher and cognitive scientist. And he has this wonderful book called Strange Tools. And he says that art is a strange tool. So what Noe explains is that we're organized socially and politically and culturally, but what art, and by that he means also dance and music and literature, is it you're, when you're enmeshed in how you're organized, your structure, you don't see it. You just take it for granted and it's just operating on you. But art is a strange tool. It makes things look strange. It lifts you up to a second level where you can see where you're placed and see how you're structured. When I started visiting um, the sites, when I decided to do this series of photographs, I wanted to go to sp you know, specific sites where big Canadian battles had happened, so where Canadian troops had had the biggest impact, but also probably the most people died at those sites. So I researched um, the front line, no man's land, the places where big Canadian battles happened. So I started in Ypres in Belgium and looked at areas around uh, that where 
where these battles had happened. So Passchendaele, um, all around Ypres, there's a number of different sites. And uh, what I was attracted to, rather than memorials or cemeteries, which are all over the place there, I wanted to look at the land. I wanted to look at the landscape today to see what is there any trace of that horrific past left there? What kind of horrors, uh, you know, might I find by just looking at the landscape? Because with my photographs, the kind of photographs that I've been doing for years, when I take photos in places that have a lot of people in them, all the people disappear, they become ghosts because I have very long exposures. But what happens when you photograph a place where there, there are ghosts? And so it was this, this idea of, of trying to look at that landscape and hopefully generate the person looking at the photos after that same kind of feeling like the, the earth has healed itself. It's now not sleeping green anymore, it's, it's green. The farmers are plowing fields. Um, but you know, when you go to these locations, do you have a sense of that? And if you look at these photos, so I, once I took the photos and sometimes they're a farmer's field, for instance, the one that's on the poster, uh, this one here, Friesenberg Ridge, this is uh, near a place where uh, Patricia, Princess Patricia's light infantry, first, the first gas attack happened. So that's the first time that gas was used against troops. And this was a big surprise, it was horrible. Uh, people died horribly or were injured very badly. But now, you know, it's a farmer's field. You see the row of trees. The field is plowed up. They plant carrots and beets and so on. And there's even an amusement park behind that forest. But what I wanted to do is, is use light and use uh, different things I had collected at the site and, and put them on the photograph. So I still use traditional techniques. So I still print in the dark room. But in the case of this one, that slash, it's not digital, it's not Photoshop. What I did was I project, I printed the image or I projected the image and it was still, the, the paper is still sensitive to light. So I'm working in complete darkness, which is interesting too, because a lot of the battles happened at night and in darkness. And I, in that case, I had a piece of black paper over top and I had a slash. So it was almost like doing, you know, this performance through the paper and then I went with a flashlight and I went shoosh, like this flash of light. So it may even be like what they saw at night with the light fla you know, flashing and so on. And that light burned a streak into the paper. I have no idea whether I'm in the right spot when I do it, because again, it's chance. A lot of it is working in darkness. So again, it, ref it reflects on what may have happened with the troops. It's chance if you're killed, it's chance if you get hit by this, it's, you know. And so a lot of the, the process for me in the dark room was almost, um, you know, alchemy. I almost felt sometimes, you know, like this, you know, not magic, but it was a strange kind of performance process, looking at the image and then uh, having these different elements that I would, you know, interact. So some of them didn't work, you know, the, they weren't, but in this case, it had this, that looks like a burn, but it also looks like a scar and how almost when you put iodine on a scar and this, this, you know, so it looks like a flame, it looks like a scar through the landscape and that you can almost go in through that cut, you know, and so the fields are plowed and this is plowing the photograph and, you know, you can get inside of it. So there's a lot of symbolism and, and a lot of that poetic kind of symbolism is, not, I, you know, I hadn't used that before, but a lot of it came from the poetry and the literature that I read from that time period too, what um, uh, was written, you know, uh, in the way they tried to describe things that had happened to soldiers in the field and, uh, you know, get us, try and transfer that into some of the images. So that same kind of poetry of those moments would, would exist. I was talking um, about how I created these images and the things that I was doing in the dark room. 
And you'll see in the photos, sometimes there's ball bearings on the image. They make little circles. So they could, they're almost like stars. But in fact, the bombs were full of ball bearings, these metal balls. So when the bomb exploded, these metal balls went and they would just, you know, they would kill people more horrifically. Um, sometimes there's leaves that I collected on the site that I lay on top, bury it, rocks, different objects. So sometimes I was burying the, the, uh, the photo in rocks. But one of the things, um, one night I actually almost had a dream about this, and it was a farmer's field that I photographed in Flanders Fields and around Passchendaele. And I had, you know, there were all these tunnels dug underground that the troops would go and they would uh, actually put bombs and try and, you know, bomb from underground. And I thought, how can I make this tunnel in this, you know, where all the corn was and so on. And I, I actually had this image in my mind and then the next day went and trying to create it in the dark room. So in fact, I made a, I had this photo of the farmer's field, and then while I, I exposed that image, and while it's still alive, it's not printed, I had all this kind of grass and weed, and I made like a wreath of grass, and I put it on top, and then I blocked out this and just let the light keep burning here, so it became darker and darker and darker, but it has this feel of the grass because of the grass that was actually on, the, on top of the photo, and it looks so much like a a tunnel afterwards. And again, it's one of these things where I, you know, I had, it's all kind of new experimentation for me, but some of the effects, especially in that one where I had this kind of vision of what I wanted to create and then managed to, to do it in the dark room. The way that she produces the work using the older camera technology and using the pinhole cameras, I mean, I got to have the incredible privilege of, in 2016, traveling with her um, to these sites in Passchendaele and Flanders and, uh, and Vimy and Beaumont Hamel. And in those sites, I mean, I got to see how she works and that she'll put the camera down and it takes a minute or so to have the exposure. And so you're really present. It's not like today with the cell phone and you can just snap and you're not really looking at what you're doing, that you're really present in the landscape, you're hearing the sounds, and you know, you're feeling the air. And I think that that is conveyed in the work that you might not be able to say, oh, that's what's happening when you come in and you see it and you don't know it, but it, it has that feeling of just pulling you into the present and getting you to just really stop and pause and, and think and also feel. Ce qui nous intéressait ici, nous, Centre culturel canadien, c'était d'avoir euh, une, une exposition qui puisse parler autrement de la commémoration possible de la Grande Guerre. Le travail de Diane était pour nous le plus, le plus fin, avec une dimension poétique très problématique, très intéressante par rapport à la notion d'horreur de cette Première Guerre. Mais aussi, ce qui nous intéresse, c'est de travailler avec des institutions universitaires qui, au Canada, font vraiment un travail de recherche très approfondi avec les artistes, en parallèle avec les artistes. Ici, la University of Lethbridge Art Gallery, qui fait un travail formidable, comme un certain nombre de galeries universitaires au Canada, qui sont probablement un des réseaux les plus, les plus intéressants, les plus performants sur la réflexion sur l'art aujourd'hui. There's another incident that happened where I slipped when I was going into one of the sites and I slipped into a crater. And when I fell in the crater, I hit my tailbone and I was lying on the ground looking up at the sky and all of a sudden I had just this her awful feeling, just shivers through my body of, of what had happened to people there and how many people might have died in that spot. And what was, what was the last thing they saw? And it, was it the sky? Was it clouds going by? Was it... The night sky, it may have, it, all the, a lot of the battles happened at night. So that's why a number of the photos have uh, 
this galaxy, this star swirling. Um, again, again, it's this time and space. And so we're here for, you know, very short period of time in the expanse of, and that, that's what I'm interested in, these passages of time um, rather than the decisive moment. So a lot of my images with the pinhole photograph taking a passage of time. There's some sound with some of the pieces. So the sound duration is the length of time it took for me to photograph. So if you listen to the sound loop while you're looking at the photo, you'll get a sense of that space, what the sound was like there, but also how much time it took for the light to come in and ca you know capturing the light. So. That's some of the, uh, the different ways that I've made uh, these, these photographs. <laughs>